Chapter 4 of Murder in the Gun Room. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Murder in the Gun Room by H. Beam Piper. Chapter 4. Stephen Gresham was in his early sixties, but he could have still worn his World War I uniform without anything giving at the seams, and buckled the old Sam Brown at the same hole. As Rand entered, he rose from behind his desk and advanced, smiling cordially. Why, hello, Jeff. He greeted the detective, grasping his hand heartily. You haven't been around for months. What have you been doing, and why don't you come out to Rosemont to see us? Dot and Irene were wondering what had become of you. I'm afraid I've been neglecting too many of my old friends lately, Rand admitted, sitting down and getting his pipe out. Been busy as the devil. Fact is, it was business that finally brought me around here. I understand that you and some others are forming a pool to buy the Lane Fleming collection. Yes, Gresham became enthusiastic. Want in on it? I'm sure the others would be glad to have you in with us. We're going to need all the money we can scrape together, with this damned Rivers bidding against us. I'm afraid you will at that, Stephen, Rand told him. And not necessarily on account of Rivers. You see, the Fleming estate has just employed me to expertize the collection and handle the sale for them. Rand got his pipe lit and drawing properly. I hate doing this to you, but you know how it is. Oh, of course, I should have known they'd get somebody like you in to sell the collection for them. Humphrey Good is incompetent to handle that. What we were all afraid of was a public auction at some sales gallery. Rand shook his head. Worst thing they could do. A collection like that would go for peanuts at auction. Remember the big sales in the twenties? Why, here. I'm going to be in Rosemont, staying at the Fleming place, working on the collection for the next week or so. I suppose your crowd wouldn't want to make an offer until I have everything listed, but I'd like to talk to your associates, in a group, as soon as possible. Well, we all know pretty much what's in the collection, Gresham said. We were neighbors of his, and collectors are a gregarious lot but we aren't anxious to make any premature offers. We don't want to offer more than we have to, and at the same time we don't want to underbid and see the collection sold elsewhere. No, of course not. Rand thought for a moment. Tell you what, I'll give you and your friends the best break I can in fairness to my clients. I'm not obliged to call for sealed bids or anything like that, so when I've heard from everybody I'll give you a chance to bid against the highest offer in hand. If you want to top it, you can have the collection for any kind of overbid that doesn't look too suspiciously nominal. Why, Jeff, I appreciate that, Gresham said. I think you're entirely within your rights, but naturally we won't mention this outside. I can imagine Arnold Rivers, for instance, taking a very righteous view of such an arrangement. Yes, so can I. Of course, if he'd call me a crook, I'd take that as a compliment, Rand said. I wonder if I could meet your group, say, tomorrow evening? I want to be in a position to assure the Fleming family and Humphrey Good that you're all serious and responsible. Well, we're very serious about it, Gresham replied, and I think we're all responsible. You can look us up, if you wish. Besides myself, there's Philip Cabot, of Cabot, Joyner & Teal, whom you know, and Adam Treherne, who's worth about a half million in industrial shares, and Colin McBride who is vice president in charge of construction and maintenance for Edison Public Power and Light, at about 20000 a year, and Pierre Jarret and his fiancée, Karen Lawrence. Pierre was a marine captain, invalided home after being wounded on Peleliu. He writes science fiction for the pulps. Karen has a little general antique business in Rosemont. They intend using their share of the collection, plus such culls and duplicates as the rest of us can consign to them to go into the arms business with a general antique sideline, which Karen can manage while Pierre is writing. Tell you what, I'll call a meeting at my place tomorrow evening, say, at 8.30. That suit you? That, Rand agreed, would be all right. Gresham asked him how recently he had seen the Fleming collection. About two years ago, right after I got back from Germany. You remember, we went there together one evening in March. Yes, that's right. We didn't have time to see everything, Gresham said. My God, Jeff, twenty-five wheel locks, ten snap ounces, and every imaginable kind of flintlock, over a hundred U.S. Marshals, including the 1818 Springfield, all the S. North types, a couple of Virginia manufactory models, and, 
He got this since the last time you saw the collection, a real Rapp and Hancock forged flintlock. And about a hundred and fifty Colts, all models and most variants. Remember that big Whitneyville Walker in original condition? He got that one in 1924 at the Fred Hines sale at the old Walpole Galleries, and seven Patterson Colts, including a couple of cased sets, and anything else you can think of. A Hall flintlock breech loader, an Elisha Collier flintlock revolver, a pair of Forsyth detonator lock pistols. Oh, that's a collection to end collections. By the way, Humphrey Good showed me a pair of big ball butt wheel locks, all covered with ivory inlay, Rand mentioned. Gresham laughed heartily. Aren't they the damnedest ever seen, though? he asked. Made in Germany about 1870 or 80, about the time arms collecting was just getting out of the family heirloom stage, wouldn't you say? I'd say made in Japan about 1920, Rand replied. Remember, there were a couple of small human figurines on each pistol, a knight and a huntsman? Did you notice that they had slant eyes? He stopped laughing and looked at Gresham seriously. Just how much more of that sort of thing do you think I'm going to have to weed out of the collection before I can offer it for sale, he asked. Gresham shook his head. They're all. They were Lane Fleming's one false step. Ordinarily, Lane was a careful buyer. He must have let himself get hypnotized by all that ivory and gold, and all that documentation on crested notepaper. You know, Fleming's death was an undeserved stroke of luck for Arnold Rivers. If he hadn't been killed just when he was, he'd have run Rivers out of the old arms business. I notice that Rivers isn't advertising in the American Rifleman anymore, Rand observed. No, the National Rifle Association stopped his ad and lifted his membership card for good measure, Gresham said. Rivers sold a rifle to a collector down in Virginia about three years ago while you were still occupying Germany. A fine early flintlock Kentuck that had been made out of a fine late percussion Kentuck by sawing off the breech end of the barrel, rethreading it for the breech plug, drilling a new vent, and fitting the lock with a flint hammer and a pan and frizzen assembly, and shortening the fore end to fit. Rivers has a gunsmith over at Kingsville, one Elmer Umholtz, who does all his fraudulent conversions for him. I have an example of Umholtz's craftsmanship myself. The collector who bought this spurious flintlock spotted what had been done and squawked to the Rifle Association and to the postal authorities. Rivers claimed, I suppose, that he had gotten it from a family that had owned it ever since it was made and showed letters signed D. Boone and Davy Crockett to prove it. No, he claimed to have gotten it in trade from some wayfaring collector, Gresham replied. He convinced Uncle Whiskers, but the NRA took a slightly dimmer view of the transaction, so Rivers doesn't advertise in the Rifleman anymore. Wasn't there some talk about Whitney Bill Walker Colts that had been made out of 1848 model Colt Dragoons? Rand asked. Oh, Lord, yes. This fellow Umholtz was practically turning them out on an assembly line for a while. Rivers must have sold about ten of them. You know, Umholtz is a really fine gunsmith. I had him build a deer rifle for Dot a couple of years ago. Mexican Mauser action, Johnson barrel, chambered for 300 Savage. Umholtz made the stock and fitted a scope sight. It's a beautiful little rifle. I hate to see him prostitute his talents the way he does by making these fake antiques for rivers. You know, he made one of these mythical heavy 44 six shooters of the sort Colt was supposed to have turned out at Patterson in 1839 for Colonel Walker's Texas Rangers. You know, the model he couldn't find any of in 1847 when he made the real Walker cult. That story you find in Sawyer's book. Why, that story's been absolutely disproved, Rand said. There never was any such revolver. Not till Umholtz made one, Gresham replied. River sold it to, he named a moving picture big shot, for $2,500. His story was that he picked it up in Mexico in 1938, traded a thirty-eight special to some half-breed goat herder for it. This fellow who bought it now, did he see Belden and Haven's Colt book when it came out in 1940? Yes, and he was plenty burned up, but what could he do? Rivers was dug in behind this innocent purchase and sale in good faith Magano line of his. You know, that bastard took me once, just one-tenth as badly, with a fake U.S. North and Cheney Navy Flintlock 1799 model, that had been made out of a French 1777 model. The lawyer muttered obscenely. Why didn't you sue the hell out of him, Rand asked. 
You might not have gotten anything, but you'd have given him a lot of dirty publicity. That's all Fleming was expecting to do about those wheel locks. I'm not Fleming. He could afford litigation like that. I can't. I want my money, and if I don't get it in cash, I'm going to beat it out of that dirty little swindler's hide, Gresham replied, an ugly look appearing on his face. I wouldn't blame you. You could find plenty of other collectors who'd hold your code while you were doing it, Rand told him. Then he inquired idly, What sort of pistol was it that Lane Fleming is supposed to have shot himself with? Gresham frowned. I really don't know. I didn't see it. It's supposed to have been a Confederate Leech and Rigdon thirty six. You know, one of those imitation Colt Navy models that were made in the South during the Civil War. Rand nodded. He was familiar with the type. The story is that Fleming found it hanging back of the counter at some roadside lunch stand along with a lot of other old pistols and talked the proprietor into letting it go for a few dollars, Gresham continued. It was supposed to have been loaded at the time and went off while Fleming was working on it at home. He shook his head. I can't believe that, Jeff. Lane Fleming would know a loaded revolver when he saw one. I believe he deliberately shot himself and the family faked the accident and fixed the authorities. The police never made any investigation. It was handled by the coroner alone. And our coroner out in Scott County is eminently fixable, if you go about it right. A pitiful little non-entity with a tremendous inferiority complex. But good lord, why? Rand demanded. I never heard of Fleming having any troubles worth killing himself over. Gresham lowered his voice. Jeff, I'm not supposed to talk about this, but the fact is that I believe Fleming was about to lose control of the premix company, he said. I have, well, sources of inside information. This is in confidence, so don't quote me, but certain influences were at work inside the company toward that end. He inspected the tip of his cigar and knocked off the ash into the tray at his elbow. Lane Fleming's death is on record as accidental, Jeff. It's been written off as such. It would be a great deal better for all concerned if it were left at that. End of chapter 4、Chapter、Five of Murder in the Gun Room. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Murder in the Gun Room by H. Beam Piper. Chapter 5 Rand drove slowly through Rosemont the next day, refreshing his memory of the place. It was one of the many commuters' villages strung out for fifty miles along the railroad lines radiating from New Belfast, and depended for its support upon a population scattered over a five mile radius at estates and country homes. Obviously a planned community, it was dominated by a gray walled, green roofed railroad station which stood on its passenger platform like a captain in front of four platoons of gray walled, green roofed houses and stores aligned along as many converging roads. There was a post office, uniform with the rest of the buildings. An excessive quantity of aluminum trimming dated it somewhere in the middle Andrew W. Mellon period. There were four gas stations, a movie theater, and a Woolworth store with a red front that made it look like some painted hussy who had wandered into a Quaker meeting. Over the door of one of the smaller stores, Rand saw a black lettered white sign, Antiques. There was a smoke gray Plymouth coupe parked in front of it. Instead of turning on to the road to the Fleming estate, he continued along Route 19 for a mile or so beyond the village until he came to a red brick pseudo colonial house on the right. He pulled to the side of the road and got out, turning up the collar of his trench coat. The air was raw and damp, doubly unpleasant after the recent unseasonable warmth. An apathetically persistent rain sogged the seedling dotted old fields on either side and the pine woods beyond. And a high ceiling of unbroken dirty gray gave no promise of clearing. The mournful hoot of a distant locomotive whistle was the only sound to pierce the silence. For a moment, Rand stood with his back to the car, looking at the gallows like sign that proclaimed this to be the business place of Arnold Rivers, fine antique and modern firearms for the discriminating collector. The house faced the road with a long side. At the left, the porch formed a continuation under a deck roof, and on the right, an L had been built at right angles, extending thirty feet toward the road. Although connected to the house by a shed roof, which acquired a double pitch and became a gable roof, where the L projected forward, 
It was, in effect, a separate building with its own front door and its own door path. Its floor level was about four feet lower than that of the parent structure. A Fibber McGee door chime clanged as Ran entered. Closing the door behind him, he looked around. The room, some twenty feet wide and fifty feet long, was lighted by an almost continuous row of casement windows on the right, and another on the left for as far as the L extended beyond the house. They were set high, a good five feet from lower sill to floor, and there was no ceiling. The sloping roof was supported by bare timber rafters. Racks lined the walls under the windows, holding long guns and swords, the pistols and daggers and other small items were displayed on a number of long tables. In the middle of the room, glaring at the front door, was a brass four-pounder on a ship's carriage. A Philippine latanka, muzzle tilted upward, stood beside it. Where the L joined the house under the shed roof, there was a fireplace and a short flight of steps to a landing and a door out of the dwelling, and some furniture. A davenport, three or four deep chairs facing the fire, a low cocktail table, a cellaret, and, in the far corner, a big desk. As Rand went toward the rear, a young man rose from one of the chairs, laid aside a magazine, and advanced to meet him. He didn't exactly harmonize with all the lethal array around him. He would have looked more at home presiding over an establishment devoted to ladies' items. His costume ran to pastel shades, he had large and soulful blue eyes and prettily dimpled cheeks, and his longish blonde hair was carefully disordered into a wind-blown effect. "'Oh, good afternoon,' he greeted. "'Is there anything in particular you're interested in, or would you like to just look about?' "'Mostly look about,' Rand said. "'Is Mr. Rivers in?' "'Mr. Rivers is having luncheon. He'll be finished before long, if you care to wait. Have you been here before?' "'Not for some time,' Rand said. "'When I was here last, there was a young fellow named Jordan, or Gordon, or something like that. "'Oh, he was before my time.' "'The present functionary introduced himself as Cecil Gillis. "'Rand gave his name and shook hands with him. "'Young Gillis wanted to know if Rand was a collector. "'In a small way, general pistol collector,' Rand told him. "'Have you many colts now?' There was a whole table devoted to colts, no spurious Whitneyville walkers. After all, a dealer can sell just so many of such top-drawer rarities before the finger of suspicion begins leveling itself in his direction, and Arnold Rivers had long ago passed that point. There were several of the commoner percussion models, however, with lovely perfect bluing that was considerably darker than that applied at the colt factory during the fifties and sixties of the last century. The silver plating on backstraps and trigger guards was perfect, too, but the naval battle and stagecoach hold-up engravings on the cylinders were far from clear, in one case completely obliterated. The cylinder of one 1851 Navy bore serial numbers that looked as though they had been altered to conform to the numbers on other parts of the weapon. Many of the Colts, however, were entirely correct, and all were in reasonably good condition. Rand saw something that interested him and picked it up. That isn't a real colt, the exquisite Mr. Gillis told him. It's a Confederate copy, a Leech and Rigdon. So I see. I have a Griswold and Greer, but no Leech and Rigdon. The Griswold and Greer, that's the one with the brass frame, Cecil Gillis said. Surprising how many collectors think all Confederate revolvers had brass frames, because the Griswold and Greer and the Spiller and Burr, that's an unusually fine specimen, Mr. Rand. Mr. Rivers got it sometime in late December or early January, from a gentleman in Charleston, I understand. I believe it had been carried during the Civil War by a member of the former owner's family. Rand looked at the tag tied to the trigger guard. It was marked in letter code with three different prices. That was characteristic of Arnold Rivers' business methods. "'How much does Mr. Rivers want for this?' he asked, handing the revolver to young Gillis. The clerk mentally decoded the three prices and vacillated for a moment over them. He had already appraised Rand from his twenty-dollar Stetson past his Burberry trench coat to his English hand-sewn shoes, and placed him in the pay-dirt bracket. However, from some remarks Rand had let drop, he decided that this customer knew pistols and probably knew values. "'Why, that is sixty dollars, Mr. Rand,' he said. 
with the air of one conferring a benefaction. Maybe he was at that, Rand decided. Prices had jumped like the very devil since the war. I'll take it. He dug out his billfold and extracted three twenties. Nice clean condition. Clean it up yourself? Why, no. Mr. Rivers got it like this. As I said, it's supposed to have been a family heirloom, but from the way it's been cared for, I would have thought it had been in a collection, the clerk replied. Shall I wrap it for you? Yes, if you please. Rand followed him to the rear, laying aside his coat and hat. Gillis got some heavy paper out of a closet and packaged it, then hunted through a card file in the top drawer of the desk until he found the card he wanted. He made a few notes on it and was still holding it and the sixty dollars when he rejoined Rand by the fire. In spite of his effeminate appearance and over-refined manner, the young fellow really knew arms. The conversation passed from Confederate revolvers to the arms of the Civil War in general and they were discussing the changes in tactics occasioned by the introduction of the revolver and the repeating carbine when the door from the house opened and Arnold Rivers appeared on the landing. He looked older than when Rand had last seen him. His hair was thinner on top and grayer at the temples. Never particularly robust, he had lost weight, and his face was thinner and more hollow-cheeked. His mouth still had the old curve of supercilious insolence, and he was still smoking with the six-inch carved ivory cigarette holder which Rand remembered. He looked his visitor over carefully from the doorway, decided that he was not soliciting magazine subscriptions or selling fuller brushes, and came down the steps. As he did, he must have recognized Rand. He shifted the cigarette holder to his left hand and extended his right. "'Mr. Rand, isn't it?' he asked. "'I thought I knew you. It's been some years since you've been around here.' I've been a lot of places in the meantime, Rand said. You were here last in October, 41, weren't you? Rivers thought for a moment. You bought a Highlander, then, by Alexander Murdoch of Down, wasn't it? No, Andrew Strahan of Edsel, Rand replied. Rivers snapped his fingers. That's right, I sold both of those pistols at about the same time. A gentleman in Chicago got the Murdoch. The Strahan had a star piece lobe on the hammer. Did you ever get anybody to translate the Gaelic inscription on the barrel? You've a memory like Jim Farley, Rand flattered. The inscription was the clan slogan of the Camerons, something like Songs of the Hound Come and Get Flesh. I won't attempt the original. Mr. Rand just bought 6524, the Leech and Rigdon, 36, Gillis interjected, handing Rivers the card and the money. Rivers looked at both, saw how much Rand had been taken for, and nodded. A nice item, he faintly praised, as though anything selling for less than a hundred dollars was so much garbage. Considering the condition in which Confederate arms are usually found, it's really first rate. I think you'll like it, Mr. Rand. The telephone rang. Cecil Gillis answered it, listened for a moment, and then said, For you, Mr. Rivers, long distance from Milwaukee. Rivers facelit with the beatific smile of a cat at a promising mouse hole. Ah, excuse me, Mr. Rand. He crossed to the desk, picked up the phone, and spoke into it. This is Arnold Rivers, he said, much as Edward Murrow used to say, This is London. The telephone sputtered for a moment. Ah, yes, indeed, Mr. Verral. Quite well, I thank you. And you? No, it hasn't been sold yet. Do you wish me to ship it to you? On approval, certainly. Of course it's an original flintlock. I didn't list it as re-altered, did I? No, not at all. The only replacement is the small spring inside the patch box. Yes, the rifling is excellent. Of course, I'll ship it at once. Goodbye, Mr. Brawl. He hung up and turned to his hireling, fairly licking his chops. Cecil, Mr. Brawl in Milwaukee, whose address we have, has just ordered 6288. The F. Zorger Flintlock, Kentuck. Will you please attend to it? Right away, Mr. Rivers. Gillis went to one of the racks under the windows and selected a long flintlock rifle, carrying it out the door at the rear. I issued a list a few days ago, Rivers told Rand. When Cecil comes back, I'll have him get you a copy. I've been receiving calls ever since. This is the twelfth long-distance call since Tuesday. Business must be good, Rand commented. I understand you've offered to buy the Lane Fleming collection for ten thousand dollars. 
"'Where did you hear that?' Rivers demanded, looking up from the drawer in which he was filing the card on the leech and Rigdon. "'From Mrs. Fleming.' Rand released the puff of pipe smoke and watched it draw downward into the fireplace. "'I've been retained to handle the sale of that collection. Naturally, I'd know who was offering how much.' Rivers' eyes narrowed. He came around the desk, loading another cigarette into his holder. And just why, might I ask, did Mrs. Fleming think it in order to employ a detective in a matter like that, he wanted to know. Rand let out more smoke. She didn't. She employed an arms expert, a Colonel Jefferson Davis Rand, USA, ORC, who is a well-known contributor to the American Rifleman and the Infantry Journal and Antiques and the Old Gun Report. You've read some of his articles, I believe? Then you're not making an investigation? What in the world is there to investigate, Rand asked. I'm just selling a lot of old pistols for the Fleming estate. I thought Fred Dunmore was doing that. So did Fred. You're both wrong, though. I am. He got out Good's letter of authorization and handed it to Rivers, who read it through twice before handing it back. You see anything in that about Fred Dunmore or any of the other relatives-in-law, he asked. Well, I didn't understand. I'm glad to know what the situation really is. Rivers frowned. I thought you were making some kind of an investigation, and as I'm the only party making any serious offer to buy those pistols, I wanted to know what there was to investigate. Do you consider $10,000 to be a serious offer? Rand asked. And aren't you forgetting Stephen Gresham and his friends? Oh, those people, Rivers scoffed. Mr. Rand, you certainly don't expect them to be able to handle anything like this, do you? Well, the banks speak well of them, Rand replied. Some of them have good listings in Dun and Bradstreet's, too. Well, so do I, Rivers reported. I can top any offer that crowd makes. What do you expect to get out of them, anyhow? I haven't talked price with them yet. A lot more than ten thousand dollars, anyhow. Rivers forced a laugh. Now, Mr. Rand... That was just an opening offer. I thought Fred Dunmore was handling the collection. He grimaced. What do you think it's really worth? Rand shrugged. It probably has a dealer's piece-by-piece -piece list value of around 70000 I'm not nuts enough to expect anything like that in a lump sum, but please, let's not mention $10,000 in this connection anymore. That's on the order of Lawyer Marks bidding 75 cents for Uncle Tom. It's only good for laughs. Well, how much more than that do you think Gresham and his crowd will offer? I haven't talked price with them yet, Rand repeated. I mean to as soon as I can. Well, you get their offer and I'll top it, Rivers declared. I'm willing to go as high as 25000 for that collection. They won't go that high. Although he just managed not to show it, Rand was really surprised. Even a consciousness of abstracting had not prepared him for the shock of hearing Arnold Rivers raise his own offer to something resembling an acceptable figure. A good case, he reflected, could be made of that for the actuality of miracles. He rose, picking up his trench coat. Well, that's something like it now, he said. I'll see you later. I don't know how long it's going to take me to get a list prepared and circularize the old arms trade. I should hear from everybody who's interested in a few weeks. You can be sure I'll keep your offer in mind. He slipped into the coat and put on his hat, and then picked up the package containing the Confederate revolver. Rivers had risen, too. He was watching Rand nervously. When Rand tucked the package under his arm and began drawing on his gloves, Rivers cleared his throat. Mr. Rand, I'm dreadfully sorry, he began, but I'll have to return your money and take back that revolver. It should not have been sold. He got Rand's sixty dollars out of his pocket as though he expected it to catch fire, and held it out. Rand favored him with a display of pained surprise. Why, I can't do that, he replied. I bought this revolver in good faith, and you accepted payment and were satisfied with the transaction. The sale's been made now. Rivers seemed distressed. It was probably the first time he had ever been on the receiving end of that routine, and he didn't like it. Now you're being unreasonable, Mr. Rand, he protested. Look here, I'll give you seventy-five dollars credit on anything else in the shop. You certainly can't find fault with an offer like that. I don't want anything else in the shop. I want this revolver you sold me. 
Rand gave him a look of supercilious insolence that was at least a 200% improvement on Rivers at his most insolent. You know, I'll begin to acquire a poor idea of your business methods before long, he added. Rivers laughed ruefully. Well, to tell the truth, I just remembered a customer of mine who specializes in Confederate arms who would pay me at least 80 for that item, he admitted. I thought... Rand shook his head. I have a special fondness for Confederate arms myself. One of my grandfathers was in Mosby's Rangers, and the other was Barksdale, to say nothing of about a dozen great uncles and so on. Well, you're entirely within your rights, Mr. Rand, Rivers conceded. I should apologize for trying to renege on a sale, but, well, I hope to see you again soon. He followed Rand to the door, shaking hands with him. Don't forget, I'm willing to pay anything up to 25000 for the Fleming collection. End of chapter 5